Welcome. It looks like we're starting to get some folks joining us here. seeing our numbers climb up. So thank you to those of you who were waiting. We're gonna go through a few housekeeping items in just a moment. All right, it looks like we've reached critical mass here. Thank you um, to everyone who's joined so far. Uh, we're so glad to have the opportunity to connect with you from wherever you may be, um, perhaps like me at home uh, during all of this. My name's Ashley Metzger. I'm the Outreach and Conservation Manager at Desert Water Agency. And uh, we are going to show you some of the features on Zoom in the event that you're new to using Zoom, um, you'll see the little chat icon, um, the, the speech bubble with the three dots. That is where you can request technical support. And um, throughout the webinar, we may ask you to um, put some items in the chat uh, during our polling. Also, if you have any questions for our speakers today, You'll see a little box with a Q in it for Q&A. If you could enter your questions in there, that would be most excellent. It helps keep us organized and make sure we get to as many of your questions as possible. Today's topic is pipeline replacement, the 411 on how it's done. Um, this is a, a huge issue for our agency, something that we've been grappling with um, for years, and we're very excited to have some of our wonderful experts here to tell you not only about how we decide which pipelines to replace and get them ready for that, but actually talking about this year's project and next year's projects. Um, so before we get started, I did want to let you know that we are recording this webinar and it is live on Facebook. But uh, none of you in, in the viewer world out there are on camera or um, have your mics live. So don't worry if you need to get up and use the restroom or grab a snack or water, uh, feel free to do so. You won't be interrupting and you can always catch uh, the full recording on our YouTube page later today. Um, and, and because you are in listen only mode, Again, if you're having trouble, please do use that chat feature. So with that, we are going to start our welcome poll. We have a few questions to get us started. All right, so those of you on Zoom will see these questions. For those of you watching later on, on Facebook or YouTube, the questions are, have you attended a DWA workshop in the past? Uh, what best describes you? Have you ever witnessed a water leak? And have you ever seen DWA personnel making repairs? So go ahead and take a couple minutes to answer those questions and we will share everybody, everybody's responses. We're gonna give you about 15 more seconds to answer those questions. All right, so the results are in. It looks like we've got a pretty good split here of about a third, a third, and a third. So yes, some folks have attended our workshops in the past in person uh, or online. Yes, some have attended only online. And for about a third of you, this is your first 
DWA workshop. Well, welcome. We're so glad you've joined us. And uh, we do one of these a month. So if you like what you hear today or have any ideas about future topics we can cover, we'd love to hear that. Uh, what best describes you? It looks like mostly we've got residents with their own yard. So folks who live in a single family home. Have you ever witnessed a water leak? 67% of you said yes. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, we do have a lot of leaks out and about. So it makes sense. And, and some of them are leaks of pipeline in the street and some of them are probably leaks that you've seen of, of private irrigation and things like that. Have you ever seen DWA personnel making repairs? 60% of people said yes. Wow, that's good. Our trucks are out and about. Uh, we have a very uh, hardy construction crew that does incredible work. So it makes sense that, that we've been pretty visible in the community. All right, well, thank you for sharing those answers with us. We're gonna go ahead and get started and hear from our first speaker today. So I'm really honored to introduce Sarah. She is an absolute joy to work with. Uh, she's a staff engineer and has been with DWA for 14 years. She actually started at DWA as an intern and uh, she graduated from UCR and she is just has so much attention to detail and really makes sure that these projects run smoothly. She is really on top of the contractors that are working on our construction projects and you know every time we need help to make sure that customers are being treated the way they should be, uh, she goes above and beyond to make sure that happens. So Sarah, take it away. Thank you, Ashley, for that amazing introduction. Undeserved, but I appreciate it. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad all of you could make it today to this webinar. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you about pipeline strategy and how we determine which pipelines to replace as well as the design process that goes into one of our pipeline projects. So to start off with just a few quick facts about our system in general, we have over 420 miles of water pipelines in our system. The pipelines range in size from as small as two inches in diameter all the way up to our big boys, which are 42 inches in diameter. Um, we have a lot of different materials that our pipes are made out of, including but not limited to bare steel. Uh, we have lined and coated steel, we have cement pipes, um, and we have ductile iron pipelines, which are our more recent pipeline installations. And the material, it really depends on the age of the pipe itself. Um, as we go through time, they start making pipes out of different materials, and that's what we'll use. Um, we have pipes in our system that are as old as 80 years old. Um, and as with all things in life, they have a shelf life. So there will come a point in time where they will start to fail. That's where you see those leaks. And it will um, come time for them to be replaced. Next slide. So how do we determine with all those pipes in our system, which pipes we need to replace next? The agency maintains a very um, extensive pipeline database it includes all of the information for every pipe in our system, including the year the pipe was installed. It will include the diameter of the pipe, what material it's made out of, how long the pipe is, how the street it's on. We will include the to and from streets that tells us um, basically the, the section um, of street that it's in. Next slide. Now, as you've all indicated in your survey at the beginning of this presentation, we have leaks. Um, every time a leak occurs and our construction crews go out and make repairs, they will fill out a very detailed leak report for us. Uh, some of the information that they include on the report is the size of the hole. So it could be as small as a tiny little pinhole in the pipe and it could be one to two inches. It really just depends on the um, specific circumstance. Uh, we'll get information on the amount of time that the pipe is leaking, and that's an estimate. So 
So we'll utilize AWWA equations that give us an idea of how long it takes the water to surface. And then they will account for the time it took them to respond and complete the repair. We will have information on where in the street the leak was located. That allows us to see whether we have concentrated sections of a street that are leaking or whether it's kind of the whole street that's starting to fill. And we'll also have information on the hours that our construction crews are out there making those repairs. And what that does is it puts a dollar figure on how much money we're spending making these repairs. And that allows us to kind of compare what we're spending on repairs versus what it would cost us to completely replace that section of main. Next slide. Using the information that we received from these leak reports, we will put together a priority list, or as we like to call it, a score report. Um, and we include a lot of different, different information in this report. We grade our pipeline uh, based on a number of different factors, including the total number of leaks that that specific pipe has experienced over its lifetime. We will uh, look at the number of recent leaks, let's say within the last five years or so. Uh, we do have the option of specifying a timeline. If we want to look at maybe the last two years, we could do that as well. We will take a look at the number of leaks per thousand feet of pipe. So that will give us an idea of the concentration of leaks in a given space. And we'll look at, again, those number of labor hours so that we can put a dollar figure on, um, on these repairs and the leaks that we're making to these pipes. And some of the other items that we'll definitely consider are any upcoming city projects. We request on an annual basis their paving project list, and we do our best to coordinate with them as they do with us. Um, their projects with ours so that if at all possible, we can get in there before they do and replace the pipeline. We'll also take a look at our general plan and what that will tell us is whether or not a pipe that we would like to replace might need to be upsized to a larger diameter. And a reason for that could be to move water from one part of the system to another if we have proposed projects that we see coming down the pipe or maybe a new reservoir or something that we're going to install. So these are all things that we'll take into uh, consideration when we're putting together this priority list. Next slide. So this is an example of that priority list, or again, as we call it, our score report. On the left-hand side of this table, you will see the total score for a given pipeline. Um, you'll see in the middle in black ink, the general information for each section of pipe that we're looking at. And on the right-hand side of the table, you have color-coded columns. The blue column would represent, in this case, the total number of leaks that that pipeline has experienced in its lifetime. The green column would be recent leaks, meaning maybe the last five years or so. The purple column is that leaks per thousand feet, so that concentration of leaks within a given section. And then that red column is the labor hours. Um, now you'll see on this particular report, we opted not to factor the labor hour score into the total score. We have the option to either include that or not include that, depending on what we're looking at. Next slide. When we're considering which pipelines to replace, if at all possible, we do want to try and group our pipelines together into neighborhoods or blocks of streets. And the reason for that is uh, we don't want to come back and bother you guys more than once if we don't have to. Um, we would like ideally to get in and out of a neighborhood in one shot. It's not always possible, especially in the larger neighborhoods, but we will make our best attempt to make this happen. Next slide. So once we've decided which pipelines we're going to replace, our next step will be to estimate how much we think it's going to cost to replace each section of pipe on our list. Now, in order to do this, our engineers will take a look at the most recent bid prices that we've received on, let's say, last year's replacement pipeline project. And that will give us an average bid price for each component of that pipeline replacement, including the pipe itself, um, it will give us a cost for connections to existing pipelines where we might need to tie back into an existing main. It will give us a price for the number of services, um, the hydrant. If it's a commercial area, we'll look at fire services. 
we will get a price or an estimate for the paving cost for our trench line. We will look at in inspection costs because we do employ full-time inspectors on these projects. And we'll also look at any DWA work that we might need to perform. So that would include installing any valves for the contractor to connect to, making any abandonments, or installing any T's on maybe an existing pipe. Now, once we've completed these estimates, we'll send them up the hall. Management will have a look at things. Um, once they're happy with it, they will approve the estimate and they will include it in next year's upcoming fiscal budget. Next slide. So once management has approved the estimate and they've included it in the budget, what's our next step? So the next step for us in one of these projects is to move on to our design phase. Next slide. The design phase takes quite a while. Uh, so on one of our more large scale projects, which the last three or four years have been this way, it will usually take us about six months to get through a complete design phase from start to finish. And that might seem like a really long time, but there's a lot that goes into completing a design on one of these projects. I know our last several years, we've replaced about 15,000 linear feet of pipe, um, and that's a lot. That's about 10 to 15 streets, I would say. And so it takes a while. Um, so let's take a look at the different steps that go into designing one of these projects. Next slide. The first thing that we need to do when we are <clears throat> starting into our design phase is to gather as much information as we possibly can to tell us what's in the street right now. So what we'll do is we will send out informational request letters to all of our utilities in the area asking for facility maps that they might have. Um, we will look at the county websites for survey maps and we'll get basically anything we can to tell us what's in the street. Next slide. We'll also hire a company to perform a video survey of the existing sewer mains that are both paralleling as well as crossing um, our proposed pipeline. And what this video will tell us is whether or not there's any pre-existing cracks or sags or damage to the sewer mains. And it's also useful because it will give us an approximate location of the sewer laterals that are in the street, which are inherently difficult to uh, locate. So this is a very useful tool for us. Next slide. And once we've done those things, our next step is to go out into the field and perform an initial topographic survey of each street. Now, we use a combination of technology as well as good old fashioned measuring tape uh, to finish this survey. Our GPS device will allow us to collect coordinate points. So that gives us a northing and an easting for every point we shoot, as well as a ground elevation, which is useful when we're doing profiles for pipes. Our GPR device that you'll see in that middle picture right there, uh, GPR also stands for ground penetrating radar. And that is an extremely useful tool for showing us what's under the ground. So what it does is it works as a signal that it bounces into the ground. If it hits something solid, it will shoot back a signal to us and we'll see it on that little screen that you can see right there in that small square. And it's extremely useful for identifying things that are in the ground that might not show up on somebody's facility map. So let's say, an abandoned pipeline or something that maybe not in use anymore, but is still there. And again, if all else fails, we will rely on our good old fashioned measuring tape. Next slide. So we shoot just about everything when we're out on a street. Uh, we'll get anything we possibly can, including monument points uh, for center line of the street. That helps with our alignment. We'll shoot curbs, gutters, driveways, sidewalks, pavements. We'll do vaults. We'll do manholes and meters and um, mailboxes even. I mean, all told, by the time we're done with our survey, we've collected hundreds and hundreds of points. We'll take those points back into the office and we will plug them into our drawing to create our base map. Next slide. So once we've plugged all these points into the drawing, we have connected the dots. We have an idea of the lay of the land, so to speak we will start to determine what we think is the most ideal spot in the street for our new pipeline to go. So that would be our proposed pipeline alignment as you'll see highlighted here in yellow on this drawing. Next slide. 
One of the things that we have to consider when we're selecting that alignment is maintaining the required minimum distance horizontally and vertically from other utilities that are already in the street. So we do have specified distances that we have to, to maintain for each uh, type of utility, and that can be difficult sometimes. So it takes a while to make sure that we're accounting for all those distances. Next slide. And as you can imagine, sometimes selecting an alignment can be challenging. Uh, the older a street is, the more crowded it's likely to be. Um, contrary to popular belief, when we abandon a pipe, we don't pull it out of the ground. It stays there. So while it's not in service anymore, it's still taking up real estate in the street. Um, so again, the older a street is, the more you're going to find in there, and the harder it is to find an open space to install your new pipe. Next slide. Once we've determined what we think is the best alignment for our pipes, we will contact USA or Underground Service Alert. This is a required step for anyone before they start digging uh, for any sort of construction. Uh, you're required to call at least 48 hours before you plan to dig. And this allows existing utilities to come out and mark the approximate locations in the street where their existing facilities are located. So if you guys have ever driven down the street and seen a whole bunch of different paint marks on your road, that's probably what it is. Um, next slide. So we'll utilize those USA marks to conduct potholing. And what we're looking for specifically is whether or not the location for, let's say, a connection valve is going to work. Now, when we tap a valve on an existing pipe, we have to use a tapping machine, which is about five feet long. And so we have to make sure that thing's going to fit in there. Um, and with USA marks, they're approximate. So they're plus or minus two feet. So where the mark might show the uh, existing facility five feet away from our main, in reality, it might be as close as three. So this is an essential step for us to verify that we can install what we need to install. And the information that we collect from these potholes will allow us to go back to the office um, with this information and finish up the uh, finishing touches on our drawings. Next slide. Okay. So now we move into the finalizing design part of this project. And this, to be quite honest with you, is the most labor intensive and time consuming process. It takes a really long time to go through these drawings and add every single call out and bubble and station. Um, you'll see on this example right here that we have called out every crossing um, of an existing utility that our proposed alignment will make. We've called out every deflection in the pipe. We've called out our connection points um, where we're starting and ending restraint joints, which is an added um, restraint for the pipe that makes it stronger against movement um, and every little detail. So this is a very time consuming process. Next slide. Once we have gotten to a point where we think our drawings are about 99% complete, we will use them to develop our contract document. So part of our contract includes the bid schedule, which is an itemized list of the different components that go into this pipeline project. And this is what the contractors will use to plug in those prices for each part of the pipeline. We'll include a special requirements section, which is basically any special instructions that we need to make sure the contractor is aware of, whether it's working hours, whether it's a special part maybe that we don't normally use. Um, we will include the work to be performed by the agency, both before construction starts and after the contractor's finished. We will include our standard drawings, which are basically how-tos for each uh, component of the pipeline, including the depth of the pipe in the trench, the services, hydrants, what have you. And then we'll include those boilerplate specs, of course, that go into every project that we perform. And this set of contract documents will go through several reviews because, again, we're trying to make sure that we've covered everything and we're not leaving anything important out. Next slide. So we've completed our drawings. We feel like they're, they're nice and tight and they're good. We've completed our contract documents. So our final step, really, before we go out to bid is to send our drawings over to the city 
they'll look at the location in the street. The fire department will actually look at the fire hydrant location and make sure that they're okay, they work for them. And then they'll sign those off. Um, we will prepare a staff report for our board of directors requesting authorization for us to put this project out to public bid. And then once that is approved, we will start our bidding process. The bidding process, it takes about four weeks because we have to have time to advertise the project. And then the contractors, they have to have time to go out to every single street and inspect it. And they're required to sign off a document in the contract that says they've done so. Um, and then we set up a date to have a public bid opening where we collect those bids and we read them out loud. And once we've collected our bids, the engineers will go through every page of the contract, every page of the bid docs. They'll make sure that the numbers add up, that there's nothing missing. And then we will award the contract to the successful bidder and start into the process of getting the project going. And with that, that is my last slide. So I'll hand it back to Ashley. Thank you, Sarah. It's incredible how comprehensive these projects are, and I'm sure we'll have lots of questions for you uh, when we get to the end of our presentation here. I'd like to invite our next speaker, Maya Lopez, up. She's one of our staff engineers and has been with DWA for six years. She is a Cal Poly Pomona graduate and a uh, a new mom. She's got a, a one-year-old at home and she is she too is a delight to work with. We are just so fortunate to have not only so many great engineers, but so many great women in engineering. So Maya, I'll let you kick off your discussion on this year and next year's projects. Thank you so much for that, Ashley. I appreciate it. Um, I am uh, Maya Lopez. I'm a staff engineer here at the agency and I am the project manager for next year's pipeline. But in my presentation, I'm going to review uh, this year's pipeline as well. So I'll start with that slide. So this year's pipeline is taking place on Avenida Caballeros between Vista Chino and Chiva. This pipeline is um, that we've uh, put in place now is a 30 inch uh, ductile iron pipe. And it's to replace an old main um, that's 20 inch in diameter and that is 71 years old. And this pipeline um, is, ru is running um, 24, approximately 2,400 linear feet, which amounts to just um, shy of a half a mile. Next slide. So in the design process for this particular project, we, as Sarah has mentioned, we have, um, surveyed the area, the project area, and located all of the uh, utilities that would cross our proposed alignment. And in this particular case, um, since it is a proposed 30 inch pipeline, we draw a profile. And so I will show you an example on the next slide. Um, so for the area highlighted um, in the previous slide, this is what we have located. We pothole it and then draw a profile. So this is helpful for the contractor to understand what this project will entail in the construction um, portion of this pipeline. And so with this, is it's very helpful to them to bid it appropriately. Um, and for us uh, to draw this um, is helpful to them. So next slide. So once we have a, a completed plan um, with a, a, a final alignment and profile uh, showing the depth of the pipeline, we will complete our contract documents and specifying all the particular details that, that we wish for the contractor to bid appropriately. And um, we'll, we'll advertise and bid the, the project at, at, at that time. And so we've done this for this project. And so um, that's what that entails. Uh, next slide. Once um, the project is um, bid, we'll review all the bids and we will award the contract to the lowest responsive bid and ex start executing it. And then the contractor will move forward and um, obtain all the materials required for this and all the other information we wish to gather prior to proceeding with construction. And then we'll schedule a pre-construction meeting at that time. 
And once we are at this meeting, we have a better idea of when the actual work will take place. And then we will proceed to notify all the customers that of, the, of this work so they um, are not surprised and have, a, have an understanding of, of what is going out um, in the street. Um, and then we will proceed with staking the alignment so the contractor knows where the, the new pipe will, will go. And then construction will start soon after. Next slide. And this is uh, some of the pictures from our existing pipeline that has taken place on Avenida Caballeros. Um, the first step for the contractors to go um, and grind the street, which in other words, just break up the the pavement um, to allow the excavator to go in more easily and, and dig out the dirt and trench, uh, create that trench to install the pipeline. Next slide. And here are a couple pictures of that work taking place. Um, this particular pipeline is a 30 inch, which is considered a more, rather larger pipe. Um, and so that's some of the work you see in place. And I'll, in the areas where the pipeline is deeper than five feet, OSHA requires um, shoring. Um, and so that's what you can see on the right is the proper shoring that uh, helps protect the workers who are down um, in the trench. Next slide. And then moving on after the pipeline, 30 inch pipeline is installed, then all the side streets have to um, be connected. And so those sometimes could be um, rather smaller sizes uh, in pipe. And so that's what some of these pictures are, are displaying, some of that work that's taken place. Next slide. Once that work is completed, um, we do require the contractor to install a base pave. And so you start seeing the, the street returning to um, its original uh, condition and where people are able to drive more readily, um, but our work is not quite complete. We still have a little bit more to go, but that's just an, uh, some pictures displaying that. Next slide. So the next step is uh, the service installation. So this is the connection that um, taps to the main, the new main and runs to uh, the customer's uh, property. Um, we don't time over quite yet. We still, keep the existing line in service with the old, with the old services. And um, once we have everything in the new main completed and tested, um, we will start that title of work. But right now, we're, um, as, we, as I'm showing on this picture, that's what they're doing. They're just doing the service installations, which in this particular picture, they have two pits, one on top of the pipeline where they tap and the other one on the other end, closer to the customer side, usually behind the, the, the curb and gutter. And they bore through and so they don't trench all across the street. Um, they just run a, a hole horizontally and, uh, and run the line through that hole. Once we finish complete those service um, installations, we um, do the fire hydrant installations. And so that's what you see in these pictures. You see the run, um, an elbow uh, pipe that's coming up um, to install a hydrant on uh, behind the curb. Next slide. So once all that work is complete, we proceed to fill the pipe with water to um, start the disinfection, the pressure testing uh, portion of this uh, project. And so you can see a couple pictures here showing the pipe being filled using a hose and connecting to an existing hydrant. And um, once that is done, we are able to pressure test and ensure that we um, don't have any leaks or any areas that um, that are leaky and if they are, that's the time to address them um, before we tie everyone over. Next slide. Um, but we don't tie them just yet. We still have to uh, disinfect and chlorinate. And so we just make sure to do that as well. Um, and then we dechlorinate and flush that pipe. Next slide. Um, and then we'll take some, we'll refill the pipe with 
clean water from our existing system, take some bacteriological samples, ensure that we meet the, the um, regulations on that, and that would give us the okay to start tying everyone over and finalizing any um, connections from the new system to, um, to uh, the new system to what we have in place. Uh, and then um, right now, that's where we are with the Avenida Cabrillo's pipeline. And some of the final touches that will um, be undergo shortly is um, the pouring the concrete, just cleaning the whole project area and, and um, performing a final asphalt cap uh, which is one inch all across our trench uh, paving area um, of the project. Next slide. So this project took place just around the time that COVID um, happened. Um, and so some of the impacts we've um, seen uh, for this project is a little bit of a delay on the materials. This material size is, um, is I think, unique and um, may, might be to order. Um, and so we, for this particular case, the pipe manufacturer had some cases. And so there was a delay in delivery of materials. And so that, that was just um, what happened. And then um, there were some, because of the conditions we have to work with wearing a mask and distancing, there is um, a little added time there in construction as well. And um, at first we had scheduled some work in front of the middle school um, to occur in a certain time frame um, between in within the summer break, um, but that didn't that didn't end up being an issue anymore since everyone was at home um, proceeding with uh, schoolwork at home. Next slide. And so that's um, the wrap up on Avenida Cabrero. So coming up in in the future, we have um, for next year's pipeline. These are two neighborhoods that we will be performing pipeline replacements. We have area one in the Tokwitz River Estates neighborhood. This is where South Palm Canyon um, turns to East Palm Canyon in the city of Palm Springs. And in area two, um, which is referred to as the Araby Commons, this area is also along East Palm Canyon uh, adjacent or very close to the Palm Canyon Watch. Next slide. Some of the details on this project is that um, the, the um, number of feet that will be replaced um, is 9,200 feet of pipeline approximately, and that amounts to a mile and a half of pipeline. And the age of that pipeline ranges from 65 to 83 years old. So that pipeline is, is pretty um, old, and so it, it will need to be replaced and is in, uh, does have frequent leaks. And so for that reason, um, will be replacing. And right now we're currently in the design phase. Next slide. And so the project costs um, that we estimate this project to be is um, estimated to be $2,550,000. And so I have a chart, a pie chart here displaying, um, distributing that cost. And something I thought was worth noting is um, the 15% allotted to paving. Um, the rest of the pie chart is mostly for the pipe and labor materials to improve um, and a benefit to our infrastructure. But that paving cost, it's needed. Um, and it's something that you know is the cost to um, for all the area that we disrupt and, and go and create our trench. And so that is a considerable amount. Um, and so that would amount to $400,000 in this particular case. Um, and so we always try to leave that section that is disrupted by us better than, than we find it. And that's the goal there. Um, and so in this project, we will be adding an additional seven um, fire hydrants to meet um, fire safety code. And also backfill prevention uh, devices will be installed for commercial properties to comply with um, regulations. And some of the challenges that we'll be facing um, during construction is um, when we have a proposed new alignment or new pipe next to an old main, there will be some vibrations during the construction and that may spur some leaks. And so that's something we've experienced in the past. And we just um, have our excellent construction crew um, on call and are very responsive and go um, and address these repairs pretty quickly, but it's just something that 
does delay um, uh, the progress of our jobs a little bit and could be costly. Um, and so that's some of the challenges there. And another one currently during this design process are the existing utilities that we are finding in some of these neighborhoods. There are some very large storm drains under underground that you can't see, but are taking a lot of valuable space. And so we're having to work around that a little bit. And in, um, and that could add a little bit of extra cost because sometimes we have to go a little deeper with the pipe um, for some of our proposed alignments and just have to be a little more creative. Um, and so those are just some of the things that, that um, we encounter during um, the design. Next slide. So for the project schedule on this pipeline, next year's pipeline, we anticipate to go to bid in February of 2021. And following that, we will uh, review the bids and award sometime in uh, March. And following that uh, construction, we anticipate to be in on April of 2021. And so the project we hope to be completed by July of 2021st. Next slide. And so um, following that project, um, sometime in the summer or fall of next year, we also plan to uh, go back to Avenida Caballeros, but this time we'll be um, replacing the pipeline from Ramon to Satorino. Um, and that pipeline is a 30 inch pipeline as well. And it runs um, approximately 865 feet. And we have budgeted um, 1,845,000 for that. And so you can um, expect that coming uh, soon in the summer or fall of next year. And that will conclude my presentation. I'll turn it back to you, Ashley. Thank you so much, Maya. That was really great to learn about what's being done now and what's on deck. Um, so I did want to mention that there are other pipeline replacements going on on a regular basis for smaller pipelines. We call these service lines. And what a service line is, is it is the line from the water main pipeline in the street. So the, the main line in the street were those that we were just talking about. And the service lines are the ones that go off of the main line to your water meter. And those, um, some in the past we've determined uh, have a, a high failure rate and when they fail, they tend to fail catastrophically. And those are the plastic based lines that were put in generally in the 1980s. They don't do very well in our soil type and when they fail, it's a crack instead of like a hole. So it's a lot of water going out. And these photos that you see are some of the damage that those service lines, even though they're just one or two inches, can cost thousands of dollars in damage to the road, to adjacent property. So we have taken a proactive approach and we are getting rid of these uh, lines in our system. And we are coordinating with HOAs and neighborhoods on an ongoing basis to get these replacements done. And we try to update folks on next door and through their property managers. And uh, it's, it's all part of making sure that water service continues to be reliable. And then with that, we wanted to show you how you can report a water leak if you see one. Um, generally, if you are driving around and you see a puddle in the, toward, toward the middle or a little bit away from the curb, of the street, but there's no rain or, or no real reason, no irrigation, no reason for it to be there, that may be a leak and we'd love to know about it. Um, you're, you're always welcome to call our office. Uh, and if it's Monday through Friday, eight to five, press zero. If it's the weekend or after hours, just push nine and it'll get you right over to our standby folks. Um, but there is a really nifty online reporting tool, dwa.org report. If you go there, we ask you a couple of really simple questions. We wanna know the date and time that you saw the issue, and then a short description of what's being reported. And then you, after you fill that out, you'll scroll down and then you'll see, uh, we ask for the location. You know, Ideally it'll be an address, but sometimes it's a median in a street or maybe there's no clear marking of the address. So cross streets are helpful. Uh, if you can upload a photo, that's excellent. Photos are really helpful to us. 
And then, you know, any details you can give us and then your name, email and phone number are all optional. And you can use this not only to report leaks from Desert Water Agency, but also any sort of water waste or broken irrigation that you see on city property or private property, businesses, homes, anything like that. So with that, we are going to start talking, uh, taking your questions. So one of the first questions that um, we've received is how COVID has affected the budgeting. Um, you know, many local governments have suffered really significant uh, budgetary cuts due to COVID-19. And, uh, you know, certainly we'd want to understand how this could affect our uh, projects going forward. Um, so just from some background on Desert Water Agency's specific situation is, you know, we haven't seen the same kind of impacts that the city of Palm Springs has, for example, due to the decline in, in tourism during the, the shutdown period. We uh, have seen continued water use, water sales, and um, we have not had to really make any draconian cuts, although I will say we did develop this year's budget during the time of COVID. So our, our general manager told all of our department heads, you know, I don't want a wish list. I don't even want a want list. I want an absolutely need to do it this year list. So we have a very lean mean budget for this year, but it did include pipeline replacement because it's absolutely imperative that we not only save the water, um, but it ends up saving cost as well since our crews aren't going back over and over again. Um, Maya, is there anything else you can speak to on, you know, COVID-19 and, and how it's potentially going to affect your project in the, the next year? So, you know, it's, we always review and adjust our estimates based on that. And this most recent project, which was the 30 inch on Avenida Caballeros, is quite different from the project I'll be managing next year, which is eight inch. So it wouldn't be a, a good comparison. Um, you know what I'm saying? And so we don't have anything to really, uh, that would accurately um, describe the cost for, for, in terms of cost for that. Um, so time will tell, I think this next project will, will see the numbers and then that will dictate the following year if, if COVID proceeds um, the way it has. Yeah, hopefully we're not dealing with this situation <laughs> this time next year. Um, and then I'd like to invite Sarah back on camera too. Um, we have lots of, of good questions here. Someone's asking if we can explain our relationship um, to the, what they call the sewer department, which is actually the city of Palm Springs. So Sarah, can you talk a little bit about the distinction between DWA and the city of Palm Springs and kind of who does what? Sure, sure. So in the city of Palm Springs, um, the Desert Water Agency does not own, operate, or maintain the sewer system. It's actually the city. Uh, Veolia Water is the one that um, operates their wastewater treatment plant. Um, the agency does maintain a section of sewer, but it's actually in the city of Cathedral City. It's south of the wash and it's between um, the city limits on the west side to Day Palm on the east side. Very good. Um, and then other questions. Do homeowners need to replace pipe from the residents to the new pipelines? And then we also got a question about what outages people may experience. So maybe Sarah, you can speak to that. Sure. So in terms of outages, we really don't want to put you guys out of water more than we have to. Um, and that's a big reason why we'll go in ahead of time and we'll install those connection valves that I talked about for our contractor. Because what that allows us to do is keep that existing pipeline in service while they're installing the new pipeline. So in a perfect world, uh, which is what we try to achieve as much as possible, the only time we're going to put you out of service is when we're actually tying your service line over from your existing line to the new line. Uh, there may there may be times here and there where we have to shut your water off because maybe our construction department has to go in and physically cut in a T on an existing pipe, um, and that would be maybe for half a day, depending on how long it takes them. 
But again, we really do try and limit how often we're shutting you guys off. Um, and then what was the other question, Ashley? I'm sorry. Um, that, so it was the Three question seconds. about um, how long folks are off and then, um, let's see. Do they need some connection work that they need to bring? Oh, does the, does the homeowner have to do anything on their part when the, the connection happens? Okay. So what we will go in and replace for our part of the project is, as uh, Maya alluded to, that pipe from the main line to your meter and then we will tie back in the back side of your meter to your existing line. Now, for you as a homeowner, you don't have to replace your pipe um, going up to your, your house. That's completely up to you. Um, you know, it would be great if everybody could do that, but unfortunately, a lot of people can't. Um, and the one thing that I would just say to everyone is, we can't change the pressure in the system, so that's something for everybody to keep in mind. But what you might experience uh, when we put in a new pipeline is that oftentimes we're upsizing the old pipe in the street, which might be a four or a six inch, to now our minimum size, which is an eight inch pipe. Um, and you're also gonna find that with a brand new service line running to your meter, you're getting more volume through there because there's no longer any sort of uh, rusting or blockage or anything like that that might be choking down that water coming through so everything's nice and new so it's not necessarily that it's the pressure difference so much as volume that makes a lot of sense yeah so you know i work with your team pretty closely on notifying people about these projects coming into their neighborhoods we want to let them know and and you know generally it's it's really great people are so relieved to hear that their their water is really only going to be out for about two two to three hours during this whole process. So, you know, I think that that's one thing, even though they have to cope, uh, you know, with the construction and the noise and the traffic, and, and we do our very best to mitigate those things, that the in terms of their, their water service, I mean, even if a project is right outside their door for, you know, three months, it's it's a very short window of time that they're actually without water. And like you said, it's it's because that water is so, essential to them, you know, living their daily lives. Um, right. Someone asked about, do the, does the project funding come from ballot measures like Measure J? No, we wish we had Measure J funding. Um, that's the city's funding. They use a lot of that for road repaving and we do work as closely as we can with the city um, to coordinate so that we're not ripping up newly paved streets to replace the pipeline. We try to get in there before they do um, but this funding comes from, you know, water water bills that are paid from water rates um, that that folks pay every month. So, you know, it's our community, um, you know, funding these things. It's it's you. So thank you for uh, continuing to allow us to do this critical work. Um, and then a couple more questions here. Um, Questions about how, how how often would you say that you find things along the way that you weren't expecting that may delay or cause issues with construction? Maya, that might be a good one for you since you're kind of in the thick of it right now. I think um, it could happen and it has happened on occasion, but we do a pretty thorough job. We do record requests and we have a pretty nifty tool, which Sarah had mentioned the DPR that helps pick up things pretty well. Um, there, we Not everything, and so that's why we'll come up on something and we'll have to work around, but, um, and it it's easier to deal with um, surprises when we're installing eight inch as opposed to 12 inch. I'll save that much, um, but yeah, it happens. And um, so we just assess the situation and then make um, changes as needed. So flexibility is key, just like everything in life, right? <laughs> Very true. All right, so we're gonna take one last question. I have here, do residents need to be fearful of the high pressure or the higher volume, Sarah, that you described, uh, mm -hmm. popping off angle stops or, or, or doing uh, any damage to their property at the time of changeover? Okay, so what I would say with regard to that is Keep in mind that everything that's on the front side of your meter, meaning from 
um, the main line out in the street right up to the meter is replaced, okay, during the pipeline project. Um, and every time that our construction crews do a tie over, they will test it first. They'll turn things on, they'll make sure there's no leaks or issues uh, before they move on to the next service. So that is something that they check and they ensure that everything is working. The contractor also does that with respect to everything that's attached to, um, that's leading up to the meter, I would say. So it gets checked several times to make sure that it's tight and it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do before we move on. Very good. Um, so one last thing we got here that I, I really wanna address. How many years do you expect this replacement project will take? Well, it's like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, you know, as Sarah mentioned, we have over 420 miles of pipeline. So, you know, once we get to the uh, section that's in most dire need right now, there will be a whole new section that needs to be replaced. So the good news is that what we're replacing now typically has a lifespan of about 50 years and we're replacing it with material that has a lifespan of about 100 years. Um, so we will be getting more life out of the pipe we put in the ground today, but it is an ongoing effort. It's something we're going to have to continue to stay on top of, um, I think just in perpetuity. So that, that will keep uh, these lovely ladies very busy. I wanna thank them very much for their time. And then before we say goodbye, we wanna pop up a little poll um, to kind of see how, how you received the information, whether it uh, may change any of your actions here. So question number one, have you ever reported water waste? Uh, after today's information, would you report water waste? Or are you more apt to? Uh, question number three, did you learn something new today? And question number four, how did you hear about this webinar? So if you wouldn't mind popping in a few uh, responses to that. We'd really appreciate it. And then I cannot thank uh, both Maya and Sarah enough. And hopefully you all, uh, like I did, learned something new today. Uh, so we'll give you about one more minute or rather probably about 15 seconds to finish up that poll. And just know if you have any questions that we didn't address, you're always welcome to reach out to us today. Um, we'll, we'll put a slide up on the screen that has an email address and that'll come to come to me and I can shoot your questions over to Maya and Sarah and they'll get back to you. Um, so our poll responses, have you ever reported water waste? It's about a 50-50, slightly more people have than have not. I would expect that in this group of folks who attended the webinar. It's, it's not exactly a, a random sample here of our community. These are, you know, you are attending because this is something that you think is important. So thank you for reporting water waste in the past. If you haven't done it yet, you know, please keep your eye out. We need those eyes and ears uh, over that hundreds of miles of pipeline. You know, uh, it's, it's critically important and we really value those reports. And then everyone said that they would report water waste after today. So yay, thank you. And it thank looks you. like also everybody learned something new. Absolutely zero people said they did not. So good job, guys. <laughs> um, and then most folks heard about this through our email. So very good. If you would like to share this webinar with anybody, it will be on our YouTube page later today. You can also share it on Facebook. And then there is our contact information. Um, please feel free to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We also post on Nextdoor if you ever need anything. Um, or have any questions or want to stay uh, up to date with the latest and greatest, those are the best ways to do that. And uh, we hope to hear from you soon. And our next webinar will be on Tuesday, December 8th at noon. We're doing it a little bit differently. This one will, instead of, uh, you know, just us talking to you, we're going to have a, a fun workshop. We're all going to get together and we're going to get, everyone can see each other's faces and we're gonna work on some succulent ornaments. It's something we did in person last year, but this year we're doing it virtually. It requires a $5 donation to our Help to Others program. And not only will you help a family in paying their water bill, but you will also get a kit delivered to your home with a succulent and with a little ornament and some decorations and a special treat. So we'll put those all together. We'll have a lot of fun uh, socializing, something that we don't get to do all that often anymore. 
So please join us for that. And uh, details are at dwa.org slash virtual. Look forward to seeing you all then and stay healthy, stay well. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone.